Hello and a welcome to Local Writers Read for September. Um, for anyone who's been following along, this is our final event of the season. Um, this is part one of two. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, but thank you for everyone who's tuned in all season and thank you for being here tonight, whether you're tuning in live right now or if you catch us um, in the re-record. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Josh Gothier. I am here with my co-organizer, Claire Guyton. And if you're new to the series, Local Writers Read is a literary reading series featuring Maine um, poets, nonfiction writers, and fiction writers um, from different genres, different career paths, um, different styles. And we come together and we um, take an evening and an afternoon and we share stories with each other and we talk about writing and art and all such wonderful things. Uh, every event we do has a theme and uh, ending off our season strong, tonight's theme is success and victory. Uh, we invite our readers to um, interpret that theme as broadly as they feel like, and we always get a very wide range of interpretations and access points into um, the ideas or kind of the, the starting point of our discussion. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what we have tonight. Um, we'll introduce our readers in just a moment. Um, but as always, we want to give a quick shout out to, first of all, Quiet City Books. And we have our very own Courtney here tonight, the owner and operator of Quiet City, um, which in non-pandemic times is the home for this series. And um, Courtney has supported us even in pandemic times when we've had to go virtual and everything has looked a little bit different. Um, and I also just want to give a quick mention to the Lewiston Public Library, who co-sponsors this and also um, offers support for everything that we're doing. Um, so stay tuned. And um, we've got lots lined up for you tonight. But I will turn things over to Claire to introduce tonight's readers. Thank you, Josh. I'll add my welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us for part one of our final regular 2021 event. And thank you to Courtney and Julia, as we said, both friends of the series for sharing their readings tonight on the theme of success and victory. Uh, Courtney in particular, we have missed being at your store. We can't wait to come back to your store as soon as pandemic mania has released us. So again, thank you. It's really nice to see your face and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more of each other in the future. I hope so. Yes. All right, so I'm going to jump right into the introduction so we can get to the great work we're going to hear tonight. Courtney Schlachter will start us off. Courtney has her dream job as the owner of Quiet City Books. She's also a mixed media artist and maker and a sometimes writer. She's published in the Poets of New England anthology from the Underground Writers Association and lives in Lewiston with her husband, their children, and pets. They are all nerds. <laughs> We know the pets are nerds because they wear little bow ties and watch Jeopardy. <laughs> After Courtney, we'll hear from Julia Spencer Fleming, the New York Times bestselling author of One, One Was a Soldier and an Agatha, Anthony, Dillis, Barry, McCavity and Gumshoe Award winner. She studied acting and history at Ithaca College and received her JD at the UMaine School of Law. Her books have been shortlisted for Edgar, Merrill Wolf, and Romantic Times RC Awards. Julia lives in a 190-year-old farmhouse in Southern Maine. Again, thank you both so much for sharing your work with us. I'm really excited. Can't wait to hear it. So let's go. Courtney, we are ready whenever you are. Okay. Thank you for having me, Josh and Claire. This is always, always a delight, and I cannot wait to get back into the store with live events as soon as it's safe to do so. Julia, it's an honor to read alongside you. Tonight I have an autobiographical fairy tale to read for you. It's called The Little Fairy Who Lost Her Wings and The Wicked Witch Who Stole Them. The cottage sat beckoning at the end of a winding wooded lane. Seven pairs of feet made their way through the trees, past bouquets of ferns, towering pines, wild carrots and clusters of jewelweed. It appeared the ideal home after so much searching. The wind rustled the branches and carried whispers of the names of the children. Moomin was the first to hear it, and then she heard the brook babbling, the garden giggling, and the mossy tree trunks murmuring. Her sweet little heart beat faster. 
This place felt perfect and surely her parents would agree. Besides, weren't those gingerbread walls and graham cracker shingles that composed the cottage, gumdrops lining the porch and chocolate kisses framing the shiny sugar windows? It was as serendipitous as Hansel and Gretel stumbling upon a candy cabana when they were lost and weary, but here there were no witches in sight. There was a goat munching grass in the side yard and a goose honked noisily at its feet. No witches though, so yes, this was the perfect place for a family. The woman at the door introduced herself as Grandma Rayma and warmly welcomed them inside. She told them to stay as long as they pleased. What's hers was theirs. The Stewart family unpacked their things and although there was a shortage of personal space, they were happy to tuck themselves into the cozy corners of this fine cottage. After everything was in place and while the whole house slept, Lumen lay awake and stretched her wings. With careful steps to avoid creaky floorboards, she tiptoed out the door and perched on the porch railing. Her smile caught the light of the waxing moon and she took flight over the trees surrounding her new home. Oh, pardon me, did I not mention? Our little Lumen, born under a full moon on the winter solstice, was bestowed magical favors by the fairies in charge of changing seasons as a gift for her perfectly timed birth. Lumen lived with the richest of imaginations, the softest of hearts, and a set of wings that reflected light with the sparkle and song of icicles and blue moonlight. Her favorite thing was flying, and although it was best kept secret, she just loved to feel free. Having arrived early in summer, Lumen with her brothers and sisters acquainted themselves quickly to their new landscape. The lush woods were perfect for long games of hide and seek. Although the siblings thought it unfair that Lumen could hide in the tops of trees, she would still sometimes sit in the highest branches, distracted by cloud formations and daydreaming of joining great flocks of birds. The brook led them to a wide green lake where the Stuart children would swim for hours. Walking back from their swimming spot, they would snack on the raspberries that grew wild along the path. Sun warmed and nature sweet, the fuzzy red gems filled their cheeks and stained their fingertips. As their bellies grew heavy with mush and tiny seeds, they would retire to the shade of the pines again, napping near fallen trees where the beds of leaves, soft soil, and pine needles made the best resting places for fruit and sun-drunk children. Lumen would tell fairy stories to her younger brother and sister. She wove tales of tea parties atop a mushroom cap, fairy school inside of a birdhouse, and described in detail the breathlessness and wonder of soaring over forests trying to pin down just the right words for feeling weightless in midair. They didn't see Grandma Rayma watching them from the corners of her eyes or from behind heavily curtained windows, but she was always watching. A magical autumn followed that lovely summer. The woods were aglow with the fiery colors of leaves losing chlorophyll, and when the branches were bare, their play space opened up into an endless forest. It was the approaching winter that brought the changes. Grandma Rayma watched more closely since the children were spending more time indoors and they heard whispers within the walls that permeated their sleep. Their parents who had been lighthearted and cheerful in the summer and fall grew longer faces as the stretches of daylight shortened. By the light of the fireplace, Rayma's glamour dissipated. She was older, more bent, expressions harder with her eyes in a constant squint. She had hairy warts constellating her face and an inexplic inexplicable hump in her shoulder. They didn't want to admit it, but they could swear that sometimes that hump was moving. Rayma's mouth was always pinched, sphincter-like, and no longer spoke sweetness. The children were horrified by this transformation, but remained polite and kept to themselves. On more than one occasion, the Stewart children would be overcome with a sense of dread and a terrible itch. One would turn around to find Grandma Rayma cradling her hands to her ears and whispering to her smallest finger. By Christmas time, the cottage itself was seen for what it was. This was no gingerbread cottage in the woods full of grandmotherly love and the tinkling bell laughter of children. The walls were burnt toast, slathered in soured butter where flies stuck and dreams spoiled. The gumdrops were gargoyles, keeping watch for their sovereign in all directions. 
The family were prisoners under Rayma's oppressive thumb. And was it their imagination? Or had the walls closed in ever so slightly each time they slept? With everything but tiptoeing and whispering against Grandma Rayma's new rules, Christmas was a somber affair, even for this family with five children who used to smile even in their sleep. Their parents braved the elements and set out once more, this time on their own, to find a new home that could hold so many children. Something that could be theirs alone and not shared with a woman so harsh and overbearing. Something that didn't smell like sour milk and too much garlic. Grandma Rayma continued whispering to her littlest finger, claiming it was accusing the children of such violations as stealing food from the pantry, cursing at each other, and making messes in every room. Using this information, Rima would banish the children to the corners where they slept, even when the sideways winter sun was still bright in the sky. She ordered them to scrub the house on their hands and knees until bruises mottled their legs. She took the toys they'd arrived with and tossed them into a pit in the backyard. This crazy old lady was kinder to the gargoyles encircling her house, petting them fondly whenever she ventured outdoors. Even the loud goose and the grumpy old goat in the yard were treated tenderly. The Stuart children did not know what they had done to warrant such unkindness. To them, this woman was no grandma with her sharp, bitter words and cruel punishments. That she was a warden for this dilapidated shack in the woods, a wicked witch of the worst kind, for she had lured them in with kindness and let her welcome grow as cold as the sunless hours of January. Lumen sneaked out each night to stretch her wings and forget the weight of Grandma Rayma's darkness. She longed to be able to whisk each brother and sister away for a night so they too could experience reprieve. She would gather snowflakes and stardust on her shimmering wings on these midnight flights and bring them home to her siblings. Well before the morning sun would beckon their eyes open, Lumen would sprinkle silver dust on their pillows and wish them, wish them sweeter times and dreams than they faced when they were awake. The gargoyles in that strange little finger on Rayma's hand eventually reported back about Lumen's nightly escapes, and the witch raged in a frighteningly quiet way. She spit hushed curses at Lumen until the little fairy girl was a shuddering mesh, mess of welts and tears. Grandma Rayma watched with satisfaction as Lumen examined her tender wounds. The girl couldn't believe what the old woman's words had done, the damage they caused, the way it hurt all the way down to her bones. As Lumen discovered the deepest wound of all, the one on her back where her wings had just been, the gargoyle sat smugly, listening to Lumen cry. Rayma's witchy little finger twitched with excitement and the wrinkles on her face danced. Lumen's wings were in pieces on the floor. As the moment stretched on, the fragments of what had once kept her wild and free dulled to dust. The final sparkle blinked out and Lumen felt her last shred of innocent joy flood away with her tears. Her mind her mind became muted as the firelight of her imagination flickered out. Empty. She felt empty, invisible, and unlovable. Weeks passed and Lumen stayed planted near the window in the room where she slept. She barely moved even when her brothers and sisters came to her. She couldn't think of stories to tell them while they tended her wounds. She couldn't remember songs she used to sing or pictures she would draw. She could only stare out the window, watching the clouds and the birds in the sky as they moved past the treetops, where she longed to be. Forever grounded, Lumen could scarcely emote relief when her parents returned at the dawn of spring. The elder Stewarts had found a new home to rescue their family from Grandma Rayma's grasp, but they had to be cautious. If Rayma was alerted to their plan, she would surely prohibit their escape and keep them as neglected pets forever. While her family sneaked their belongings back into satchels little by little, Lumen went outside for the first time since midwinter, and with a warming sun on her skin, she felt a little more like herself. Wingless, she would never be what she was before they arrived at the cottage in the woods, but the sunshine smoothed over the last of her bruises, and she inhaled the fresh air as though she'd been holding her breath for months. 
Moomin lay on her back in the new grass, inhaling the sweetness of wet earth and leaf buds all around her. Closing her eyes, she pictured flowers nodding their heads toward her, just like they had when she was a magical winged creature. She remembered that skip in her heart when her feet would lift from the ground and how the wind would ruffle her hair as her wings carried her higher. In her mind, she hovered over the tops of trees and reached for the clouds. It was the most she'd been able to imagine since Rayma had shattered her wings. She opened her eyes in the springtime sky just as a flutter of sparrows passed overhead. Moomin had wished countless times since her wings were stolen away to have them back just to fly once more, to know it would be the last time so that she could remember precisely every breath of air on her skin and every swoop that would tickle her belly to revel in the profound magic of flight. She wished again, one wish for every sparrow, for every blade of grass that stroked her skin in the breeze. The Stewart family woke during the darkest hours the following night and sneaked away while the gargoyles slept. In their pajamas, they stole into darkness, winding their way back up the wooded lane they'd walked down months before. The children gazed longingly at the raspberry bushes as they passed knowing that once they were safely away, the tight green knots would burst into juicy redness and fall heavy from their stems with no little mouths around to gobble them as they ripened. They hoped their new home would have berry bushes nearby and know with absolute certainty that no one's bony little finger would be spying on them at any time. No more wicked witches. As earth wheeled full into summer, the Stuarts had settled into their new cottage where they were delighted to find not only the raspberry bushes they'd crossed their fingers for, but an entire acre of blueberries as well, a small pond for swimming, and a brook with a footbridge, and a different variety of pines growing in their woods that created cozy dens around their trunks with their sweeping lower branches. The family didn't speak of their time in the rotting cottage or of the witch who tricked and broken them. The past was the past and they moved forward hand in hand. In time, they had a collection of books, dolls and playthings again. So Lumen dove into volume after volume of enchanting stories so that she could feel close to magic again. Eventually, she only knew the stories on the pages. Her wings weren't even a memory anymore. They were just teasing hints inside of dreams where she soared alongside sparrows with her arms spread wide, and when she woke, she couldn't remember what she was longing for. So Lumen grew and read, and grew and read some more, until childhood was fully behind her, and she was wed with a lovely little cottage of her own where her children listened to stories and painted pictures and built castles with wooden blocks. Her children, two sweet girls much like her former self, didn't just love books like their mother did, they also loved hearing about Lumen in her childhood and about the ways that their aunts and uncles played together in the forest and swam like mer people and ate summer berries until they fell over full. She read them a story one day about a family of fairies enjoying a tea party on top of a broad spotted mushroom cap in the woods and something tugged inside of her chest. She couldn't remember reading the story to them before, but it felt so familiar. Maybe she had read it as a child. She was overcome with the urge to explore with her daughters to find fairies and was amused with herself for believing just for one moment in pixies and sprites. When she slept that night, she dreamed of a frolic of fairies bestowing a newborn girl with a set of wings so lustrous they glimmered like fresh snowflakes in the light of the full moon. As soon as the sun rose after that dream, Lumen declared to her family that they would be exploring that day, and they wandered until they found a winding lane lined by bouquets of ferns and raspberry bushes. Lumen's skin tingled again, and she felt that strange pull in her chest. They soon came upon the timber of an old cottage where the walls had fallen away and ivy had taken place of a proper roof. As the wind wound through the trees, Lumen heard the whisper of her name, and the sound of a babbling brook, and the giggle of a long-ago garden swamped in weeds. She remembered the story of a strange old woman who lived in a place like this, and the children whose joy was eaten whole. Lumen's daughters called from another spot on the property. They found a stash of toys, they said, holding in their hands disjointed dolls, stray wheels and soggy pencils, 
and teddy bears smeared in dirt. The woman and her husband went to them, digging with their hands to find what she'd lost but couldn't remember. Her fingers found scraps of fibers that made her think of onion skins, but the fragments were iridescent and even more delicate. They nearly crumbled in her hands. A rush of exhilaration swept through her belly. All at once, she remembered flying. She remembered sitting in the tops of trees and loving every creature in the world and collecting stardust and falling asleep in the woods in a tangle of her brother's and sister's arms and legs and swooping low over the lake to graze her fingertips on the glassy surface while she was flying. She thought of a wicked old witch who talked to her bones and tricked children into thinking gargoyles were gumdrops. She remembered who stole her wings. Moomin reached for her children to hold them close, pressed her face to their hair and told them about their great grandmother that they had never met. She touched her children's faces, leaving a smear of fine shimmer on their cheeks. Her wings turned to dust, returned to their true keepers. Forty fingers sifted the soil to gather all of the glimmering specks of Moomin's wings and they carried handfuls home to scatter over their garden. Moomin didn't need to fly anymore. Thank you. And next up, we'll have Julia sharing some of her writing. Sorry, I was, I was really captivated. I forgot to turn my, um, uh, my microphone back on. That was really beautiful, Courtney. Um, and what a gorgeous metaphor for the writer's journey through life. Um, yeah, Thank it you. kind of swept me away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I am reading from my seventh book, I think it is. Um, one was a soldier. Um, given our theme of victory and success, um, it's a scene that occurs near the end of the book, and but it's a little bit unrelated to the mystery, so I can read it without um, without fear. That's always a difficulty when you write crime fiction is you don't want to give you know the surprises away. Um, and all you need to know is this is about. Um, uh, Russ Van Alstyne is our viewpoint character who he's the police chief of uh, the small Adirondack town of Miller's Kill. And um, he has been allowed to come along on a federal arrest as a matter of courtesy. Um, this is not his arrest. And the man who is, um, who's the subject of this arrest warrant um, has been uh, calling him a nemesis is probably not too too far a uh, point. Um, this is actually the third book he appears in either in person or by by reference and he has been um, someone who has been doing bad things but um, his wealth and position have made him pretty much untouchable. So I think that's all you need to know. Mm. <clears throat> when they went for Opperman, they let Russ tag along. It wasn't his arrest. In the 10 days since he had called in Ellen Bain's evidence, the Army CID, the FBI, and the Treasury Department, and the GAO had all jumped on board. He was low man on the totem pole. The Army guys were respectful, and the feds were polite, but every investigator and agent he met let him know subtly or baldly that this case and this collar were way out of his league. He just smiled and let his Kasi Hari accent thicken until Tony Usher, who was on the prosecution team, said, cut it out, God damn it. You sound like you're auditioning for the lead in Lil Abner. Waiting in an unmarked government vehicle outside the Algonquin Waters Spawn Resort, it was worth it. They could have called him a traffic crossing guard and asked him to fetch the coffee and it would have been worth it. You ready? Tony put on sunglasses against the early morning sunshine. Russ checked his gun and reholstered it. Oh yeah. Tony looked at his watch. 
The MP should be pulling Weiler McNabb in just about now. He glanced over the seat to the CID investigator waiting with them and Arlene Seeley. The radio crackled. Hotel team, this is square one. An anonymous van held the FBI control team, which would be coordinating the raids on BWI Opperman's Plattsburgh Materiel Depot, as well as their offices in Baltimore. We are good to go. Russ, Tony, and the CID investigator got out. Throughout the parking lot, car doors slammed as agents and accountants and lawyers and evidence techs finally made their move. Bellhops stared and guests scrambled out of the way of the entrance. And then the team was inside, bark commands echoing off the paneled walls, a rumble of feet as they spread out to the office, the computer room, the registration desk, locking down all communication, seizing every workstation, evidence wrapping every file cabinet. Russ caught a glimpse of the manager, her mouth open as he led the arrest team up toward the stairs. Two flights up here, then stairs on either end the rest of the way, he reminded them. One elevator for the guest, one for the employees. The FBI agent in charge, a short, curly-haired woman who looked way too young for her position, nodded. You four, secure the elevators. Laughlin and Bourne with me, she gestured toward the stairs. You can wait here if you want, Chief. I can manage it, he said dryly. They ran up the stairs, one flight, two, three, until they reached the top floor and Opperman's personal suite. They flanked the door, two on each side. Russ had just enough time to wonder who was bringing the battery ram when the teeny bopper agent pulled out a magnetized card and sliced it through the key slot. She swung the door open and she and her partner stormed in shouting, federal agents, stand up and place your hands on your head. The other agent was right behind them and then Russ. It wasn't his collar. It didn't matter. They would get the credit, but he got to watch John Opperman slowly rise to his feet, his face twisted in shock and fear. He got to watch Opperman's eyes darting from side to side, looking for a way out, looking for some flunky to make it all go away. He got to watch the moment when Opperman spotted him, his eyes narrowing, the fear on his face curdling into hatred. Gotcha, Russ mouthed. They held the CEO in his four room apartment as the GAO and the defense accountants ransacked the place, loading bankers boxes with papers and external drives and a laptop. Downstairs and in Plattsburgh and Baltimore, the same evidence hunt was going on. Opperman lawyered up immediately and the first suit arrived before they had even moved downstairs. The second and third got there while the first was still haranguing the agent in charge. Russ was impressed. BWI must have hot and cold running attorneys to get them out to this remote corner of New York State so fast. When the techs had rung the rooms dry, the agent in charge announced they were taking Mr. Opperman to Albany to process him. The lawyers stopped their arguments and requests and comments, conferred in whispers with the CEO for half a minute, then disappeared through the suite's door. Rats leaving the ship, Russ said under his breath. The agent snorted. I wish by the time we get off the north way, there'll be six of them waiting for us. She glanced up at Russ. Would you like to help us escort the detainee to our transport chief? Russ guessed that was his reward for not stroking out during the run upstairs. Yes, ma'am, I would. All traces of Opperman's earlier rage and terror were gone. Walking to the elevator between Russ and the agent in charge, two FBI guys looming behind him, the CEO might have been strolling with some low mid-management employees. He made the handcuffs look like fashion accessories. The three FBI agents packed the rear of the elevator, leaving Russ and Opperman staring at their own hazy reflections in the bronze door. Opperman smiled at himself. I'll be back here by tonight, you know. Russ pasted a similar ple pleasant expression on his face. I don't think so. Opperman's smile thinned. Do you seriously think you've taken me down, Chief Ben Alstein? Russ shook his head. No, I think Ellen Bain and Terry McNabb took you down. 
I'm just here to witness it. Two tragic deaths, which have nothing to do with me. CIDs arrested Arlene Sealer, and Wyler McNabb is in army custody right now. I don't know about her, but he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who's gonna go down with the ship. My guess is he's gonna talk like a little girl at a slumber party. A disgruntled employee, Opperman's expression was bland. I have access to the top legal talent in the country. They're gonna tie these spurious charges into so many knots, you'll be retired to a trailer park in Gainesville before you see me inside a courtroom. The elevator chimed and the doors opened. They stepped into the lobby. You are a little man in a little town who has to go hat in hand before your alderman to beg for the bullets in your gun and the paper in your copier. You have no idea the power money can bring to bear, Chief Van Alstyne. None at all. Well, that took a turn. <laughs> it's, it's the flip. Who has the success and who has the victory? Yeah, that's um, what I was thinking. Um, yeah. Thank you both so much. It was, it was just terrific. And it was um, it's really fun because they're so different, such completely different styles, different kinds of stories. Um, and Courtney, the success in yours was just so complete. I loved in particular that image of the um, sort of the glitter of the disintegrated wings rubbed into the cheeks of the children, which turns this tragic thing into something so beautiful. And then Julia, my favorite moment was the mouth gotcha. And then I love how you sort of slap us all down with the, with the turn on things at the end. So now we're actually not sure who's winning, where is the success, but anyway, thank you both so much. We'll let Julia have a little breather here while um, we kick off our post uh, reading chat with Courtney. Josh will check Facebook for any kinds of um, questions or comments. So if you joined us a little bit late, this is your chance to jump in um, and put something on Facebook that we can add to our chat a little bit. So Courtney, you are a mixed media artist, you tell us. Yes. I, know, <laughs> I know a couple of other writers who are artists and Every few years, I go through these phases of flurried, arty activity myself that I probably uh, very wisely keep to myself. Um, but I'm sure there are listeners who have been moved to do both of these things as well. So I thought you might talk a little bit about how your writing and the mixed media art work together, um, feeding each other and feeding you. Or maybe these are completely separate impulses and you keep them, you sort of compartmentalize them and keep them in separate places. I'd, I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Sure. It's definitely a compartmentalized um, outlet for both things. It's a very different energy that I have to use for making art, making, um, you know, any other kind of handmade things. And, um, most of the most of the things I create are for my store. So it's like production, you know, for the most part. And it's it's still very fulfilling. It it's even if I'm making it for the purpose of selling or sharing in some way, it's it's for me because it helps it helps me feel like me because it's something that I love doing so much. And I'm always like learning new things that I can do or just honing something I've already done. And um, it's so much, so much energy that I put into that is so different from the energy I use while writing because I, I do a lot more artwork. Um, in my bio, it said I'm a sometimes writer. Um, it's less and less these days because um, I have, you know, I make things to keep up with demand at the store and, you know, changing seasons and different things that I will need to make. Um, so they're very different energies that I use for them. Um, I do always have something in my head, whether it's a story or something I want to make. And I've been like that since I was a kid. Um, Moomin in my story is very much me, um, very much in my own world, you know, very um, daydreamy and easily distracted. 
I've always been writing stories and like playing little movies for myself in my head. Um, I get new ones here and there, um, but it's very, it's a very different type of energy that I use to sit down and write and plan out a story. Um, sometimes I go back to something that I started writing years ago and I don't really do that with artwork. Um, if I started it years ago it, and I didn't finish it, it's not going to get finished. Do you know what I mean? So they both feed me a lot. They both make me feel very grounded and very much like myself. Um, those are two things that I very much identify with as being a writer or an artist, um, but they're two very separate things that don't really overlap much, even though they they might come from the same creative well, but they're, they come out in different ways. I hope that answers your question. It does. I mean, to me, okay. it, it sounds like some of the difference here is that you trust yourself as an artist more than you trust yourself as a writer. Very, yeah. You know, because you <laughs> say you, <laughs> you, you don't come back to unfinished writing. You don't think of it. I mean, you don't come back to unfinished art, mm -hmm. um, but you will sometimes come back to unfinished writing. And I suspect that the reason right. why you're not coming back to the unfinished art is you trust yourself to have mm -hmm. released it, knowing yeah. that it's gone as far as it can go. And with the writing, you you don't feel as much like you fully know where you are yet in the piece. So you can go back to, I mean, it, it's all wonderful. It's all a way to grow and, and to be creative and everything yeah. you said about how making art makes you feel, you said, it, you know, it really grounds you, makes you feel like yourself. You, you know, are things I could say about me as a writer, they all mm -hmm. apply to the writing. And also I was exactly that kid too. I was like yeah. the dreamy kid who, couldn't remember to bring my jacket, couldn't remember to bring my books from class to class. And I've, I have always attributed that to the creativity piece of needing to write. And when I am writing, like I need to be all the time, I, those things sort of get more sorted out and mm -hmm. I, and I start feeling more connected and, and able to kind of keep my head on my, my shoulders. Absolutely. It's like, I put that creativity in the right place or something. Yeah. Very. Can I leap into the conversation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Because yeah. I, I want to, so I am the, I'm a third little girl that was <laughs> like that with always with the stories running in my head as I walked by things and would, um, I, I think there's a very slender line between mental illness and writing. <laughs> and that's, you know, the stories in your head and where they're going to go. But I also wonder, um, Courtney, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, I have a number of friends who do some, you know, marvelous art. Um, and one of the signal differences to me is that art seems to be, I mean, uh, the, the, the plastic arts, you know, painting or sculpting or something is complete in and of itself. I mean, obviously you're making things because there's a man for it at your store, but, you know, having made, I know people who do painting and, it's for them, you know, and the act of painting and creating it and, and having it um, is fine. And I feel the difference is, is that writing is in some ways a little bit more like one of the performing arts in that it takes two people to complete the act. There's the writer and then there's the reader or there's the storyteller and then there's the, the listener. But it's, it's not just something that necessarily exists on its own terms, but it, it takes some give and take between, between two people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if the listener or reader is in your imagination, right? So, you know, because you don't, we all hope to get published. We all hope to get our work out there. But even in the making of it, if, if you're not positing that reader or listener, then you're not interacting with the page, you know, in the, in the way that's going to help you be successful with the piece. Because, you know, that that reader, that listener always has to be there. Somebody you're telling the story to, I think, um, to get where you want to go with the writing. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, um, I forget where I heard it said. There's a lot of writing advice that just kind of float, floats around in my head without attribution. Um, but it was something along the lines of don't write for all your readers, write for your ideal reader. 
Um, and so, yeah, similar to what you're saying, it's like it, putting words on the page, there's that one sense of like who this is for and whether it's for yourself or just like a friend or just one idealized person, you're like, I, I know who the audience is and you're writing a story to that ideal person. And then once it's done and finished, then it is out there in the world. And it, then, yeah, then it completes that circle. I think everyone encounters it in their own way. And that's gonna look different for all these different people. But like, yeah, you knew what you were trying to set out to achieve with it. Um, if that makes sense, I think it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, at a base level, you're writing, you're using language and language is about communication. So you can make art that just pleases yourself and if other people like it, that's fine. If they don't, they don't. But with writing, you know, you have to be able to let go of whether people like it or not too with writing, of course, but but you at a base level, you are trying to communicate something. That's part of the success is whether you were able to communicate. And yeah. that's not really something with art, I don't think. Although I'm not an artist really. So who am I to say? I guess it all depends, I think, um, what you're making and what you're trying to say with it. I'm not, uh, I didn't go to art school or anything and I don't, is that a doggy? Yes, this is, Hi. he's, he's <laughs> making doggy. little whimpers. This is my, uh, my Shih Tzu, Kingsley. Can you, can you, can we get your, oh, can we get you up for the camera, Kingsley? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. <He's, laughs> This is actually perfectly timed because seven o'clock is usually their um their time when they go O U T. So I think that's what this is. Okay. I, I, I just have to say you just made me make kissy faces on Zoom. I've <laughs> never done that before. <laughs> well, this is the grand finale of the local writers' read. That's right. So I think dogs kissy, kissy faces serve. Belong. Absolutely. Finish your thought, Courtney, and then I have a question Sorry, for Courtney. Julia. Oh, unless so, uh, Josh has something from Facebook. Go ahead, Courtney. So, sometimes when I'm making art, a lot of it is uh, inspired by like song lyrics. And so what I want to say has already been said. And I just want to put out what's in my head, you know, when I hear the pictures in my head, when I hear that. And then there have been pieces I've made where I do have a statement, but I don't have a lot of art statements. Sometimes I just want to make something pretty that I like the way it looks. Um, and that's also the case with a lot of the things I make, um, all the handmade things I do, like wreaths and flowers and crowns and um, all that. I just want pretty, pretty things, aesthetic things. So there's not always something to say with art for me but I think it's different for every artist and what kind of medium they're using and, you know, what their objective is. I, I, don't, I feel like you wanting pretty things, that is saying something. That is saying, I want to bring beauty, you know, into the world and see these things and appreciate it, which is entirely appropriate for, for fairies. So I think that you're <laughs> on target there. <laughs> Yeah, you're making me see things in a whole new way. <laughs> I agree, but I, I do I do like that sentence though, Courtney. Sometimes it's already been said. I do I do like that too. That's sometimes yeah. it's it's nice to take that stance, you know. What what needed to be said has already been said. I'm just gonna make something. I like that too. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I think we've talked a lot in multiple past events now. I'm thinking back over the streams we've done this season of just the, the role that art plays in all of our lives, whether it be writing or visual arts or anything. And so many of us have said like, we, we process, we understand, we think, we say things. And yeah, also just putting something out into the world. Um, I, I mean, like, that's why we're here. We keep bringing, um, bringing that piece to our, our own lives and then sharing it with other people in some external way. Um, I mean, Absolutely. especially even these past two years through these readings and Courtney through your store, I know how many other artists are featured there as well. And all these little, just th these pockets that we carve out for ourselves of kind of common understanding and beauty. Yeah. I feel like the pandemic has really been um, a double edged sword with this. It has been on one hand, you know, it's been hard for a lot of artists, either, you know, literally difficult because you were unable to practice your art if you are doing, you know, music or 
or acting or you know something that requires an audience um, or just distracting us. You know, it's it's hard to be creative when you're going no. <laughs> um, but I also feel certainly for me that I appreciate the role of arts in a more mindful way than I did before. So last. Sunday, I went to, um, had lunch with some friends in Portland, and I went to Porch Fest, which I don't know if you've heard of. It's this wonderful annual festival in the Deering uh, area, the Deering neighborhood of Portland. Um, and it's, it's literally kind of what it sounds like. It's dozens and dozens of bands playing on people's porches and driveways and, oh. and their yards. And it's everything from you know, a middle schooler with a ukulele to actual professional bands. They've got classical musicians. They've got, you know, Cajun fiddlers, everything you could imagine. And I was there with my friends and I was just feeling so moved. And of course it's all out of air. So you feel very safe. And I realized it was the first time in 18 months or more that I'd heard live music. And it was so awesome to hear you know to hear that art being practiced the way it's supposed to be and and I realized what a precious thing it is to have our a variety of so in our lives yeah I so um I'm an editor of a literary magazine that actually started with two other people right as the pandemic <laughs> dawned so <laughs> turned out to be a bad time to start a literary magazine only because my co-editors have small children and they found themselves having to homeschool their kids at the same time they were trying to launch this. So that was really tough, but it was um, extremely rewarding for us. And, and now that we, we've just started our season again and we were talking about how it wound up being a blessing in disguise that, that we had that hard work um, at, at the start of the pandemic and during the shutdown, because it fed us so much. We had other people's work. Um, we had, and we we like to, when we publish something, we couple it with two, we make a triptych and we couple it with a video or a visual art, something like that, that goes with it. So we were combing through and enjoying and absorbing and taking in and loving so many different kinds of art. And it, it really sort of helped us through the pandemic. And it also, like you said, um, makes me really look forward to hearing live music again today, we were choosing something for one of our publications and I was watching a video of a street musician doing a harmonica solo. And I watched it three times in a row and I was like so moved, I almost cried, you know, just because it was so beautifully done. And I just saw the joy of all the people on the street around him and, and the joy that was coursing through him as he was playing the harmonica. And I thought, oh, I cannot wait. It's gonna be so wonderful. I'm gonna appreciate it like never before when I get out and I see something like this again, yeah. So you mentioned that your co-editors had children, which made me think of a question that I actually had for Courtney, um, which is I'm interested in hearing about because I was, I started my writing career when I had a, 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 a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old and a baby at home and you've got children. And I'm curious as to, you know, what are their ages and how, how do you, how do you juggle a creative life with being a mother, which sometimes <laughs> it's it's not easy for me I have ADHD and I get overwhelmed so easily when tasks start building up and so if I have you know housekeeping and work and then I have you know kid stuff and then other kid stuff it's just I often find myself in a state of just being frozen and not able to do anything that's really hard and I'm I don't really know what to do about it I'm still working on you know trying to adult so to speak um, but I have a seven-year-old girl and a 14-year-old girl so I have one who's fairly independent and then one who still needs me a lot so um, you know during the pandemic I was basically a first grade teacher for the younger one and then I would say teacher's assistant. I'm not gonna take credit for being her teacher because her teacher worked really hard. Um, I helped her teacher at home. Um, and, you know, I just had to kind of monitor my 14 year old here and there. Um, 
I ha I don't have an answer for you. I don't balance things, <laughs> to I'm be just, honest. You know, I, I have to say, I never felt like I balanced things. I am now, you know, one tiny baby step away from being uh, an empty nester. My youngest child is a senior at University of Maine this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, I remember having, I, I, most of my writing career has been while also having three children. And, and I remember telling someone the way I did it is by always sucking at something, you know, oh, <laughs> so yeah. like if I was writing and parenting, the house looked like just, you know, a pit and if the house looked nice and the kids were okay. Then I wasn't writing and, you know, and, and if the house and the kids were great, I wasn't writing. So it's really hard to do all of that, you know, that triad, um, at plus really working, is. I didn't even have an outside job. So, you know, writing mm -hmm. was my job. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, like they're back in school full time. So I've, and it's only been a few weeks, but I've sort of worked into a little bit of a routine of being able to do my artwork and projects during the day when they're at school. And then in the evening after the little one went has gone to bed and I have my work days and then I try to do a lot of housework on Sundays and it's I'm not good at you know like lists and schedules and um as far as like personality types like type A's I'm like a an R S you know T U V I'm trying so hard to stick to the schedule because this pattern of sitting down and being able to make things on a regular schedule has really helped level out like my moods, you know? I've had a lot of heavy things lately kind of piling up on me and I'm sitting back and going, why aren't I, why am I not breaking down right now? You know, but I think it's because I've been able to carve out that time for myself where I can sit with my glue gun and just start sticking things on shit, you know, and um, cutting, cutting papers out and making collages. And now I have a whole beautiful list of things I want to make. I said, I'm really bad at lists, but I'm trying to make this one work. All the things I want to make for Halloween and coming up for Christmas. So we'll see, we'll see how, how this will go. Well, I'm a, I'm a type RSTUV myself. <laughs> so I totally, totally empathize with you. I didn't start making lists until my husband, who is a, a list maker, passed away. I used to rely on him to keep me on track for things. Mm -hmm. but, but it's hard um, because being a good mother and being a good artist of, in some ways are mutually they don't fit, you know, being a good mother means being there and present and open mm -hmm. for your children and available. And Absolutely. being a, you know, being a good creative person is like, it's this, it's being close to everything else and just focusing on the art and telling everything else, go away. I'm, you know, I'm not, so it, it, they really are antithetical. And I think there is a you know, every, every one of us who manages to create art while raising children, honestly, I think we either need special gold stars that they should pay us more, one or the other, maybe both. Please, please. <laughs> both, yeah. I think both. And can I just say, you know, being a, being a good person and, and adulting well, quote unquote, is a lifelong project for everybody. So why would it be any different for mothers? There's no reason why a mother's supposed to be absolutely wonderful at everything. You yeah. know, we're all just yeah. figuring it out as we go along. Yeah. Courtney, yeah. I turned 60 this summer and I'm still trying to figure out how to be an adult. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gives me hope. I'm turning 40 at the end of this year. So I'm. <laughs> I'm just starting to grasp that, you know, it's okay. You know, I, I look around and sometimes I have these friends who are my age or even younger who seem to have like, everything's all lined up and all their ducks are in a row and they've got it all. But I just have to really remind myself <laughs> surface level is just surface level. And my brain does not work that way. And that is okay. Like, I don't have to 
be apologetic about it. And, um, you know, there's things I can do to make it easier for myself, but my kids uh, have clean clothes most of the time. There's always some clean clothes somewhere. I always know where the weird random bas baskets of clothes are that I haven't put away yet. Um, they have food, you know, they go to school on time and they're very, very, very loved and they're very listened to. So I feel like as long as I have that down, everything's good and I need to start taking care of myself as well. And I'm getting there, you know, it's a process after taking care of other people for so long. It is hard. Use yeah. the use the the airplane method of motherhood. Put your oxygen mask on first before yeah. <laughs> attending to your children. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you can't breathe, nobody can breathe. Yeah, that's true. Very true. Um, I, I okay, I'm bring... gonna. Uh, oh, go ahead. You you go. No, yeah, I just want to bring in Facebook comments real quick. Um. Gary and Nancy, um, Nancy's reading with us tomorrow. Um, both were saying, Courtney, your story was beautiful. Um, they enjoyed hearing you read it. Thank you, um, Gary and Nancy. And Gary also said um, to Julia that he likes the spin um, and that the whole piece felt kind of relevant to current affairs um, where the rich think and often can kind of buy their way out of trouble as we've seen can be the case. Um, and then Gary chimed in, because um, um, for those who don't know, Gary's a local photographer um, who you'll often see at our in-person events um, when we get back there, mm -hmm. um, is saying that um, for him, art is communication. Um, a painting can convey an artist's idea and also be interpreted in different ways. And sometimes it's a beautiful thing just to be observed, like some writing can be beautiful just for the sound of the words themselves. So, yes. Very true. Julia, you are not getting away from us without giving us a few teasers for what is next in your mystery series. So um, Claire, I am writing uh, the <laughs> 10th book in the series. Um, the title, which seems to be pretty set, is At Midnight Comes the Cry. What do you think? What do you think? It's booksellers. What do you think? Yeah. I love it. I yeah, like my that. publisher yeah. likes it. My publisher likes it. Yeah. And um, in it, um, Russ and Claire uh, stumble across a, uh, a couple that are white supremacists and wind up getting sucked into investigating a, a plot. Um, Ooh. And we get to see more of their home and family life as they adjust to being parents. We get to see more of our uh, young couple, Hadley and Kevin, um, who is, is actually gone missing at the end of the last book. Um, and it's also a Christmas book. Um, so, Ooh. you know, there's, there's like some Christmassy things in between death and, <laughs> you know, bombs going off and stuff like that. It's my version of a Christmas book. <laughs> <laughs> a little Christmassy death. Who doesn't yeah, know that? Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I love Christmas and I love mystery. So I'm very excited about this. I always love that. Um, I don't know if you ever watch any of the British mystery series, but I'm always like thrilled when like, you know, Midsummer Mysteries or um, uh, Lewis, all these. I love it when the, when it's Christmas time. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why there's something there's about this a whole mystery. genre of Christmas mysteries people do my uh, friend mm -hmm. Reese Bowen who does among other things this really great series set in kind of between war Britain with these aristocrats it's like like if Downton Abney was solving mysteries and was funny yeah. um, and she's coming out with a Christmas one this year so um yeah people love it people love yeah. to read about the season and also read about dead bodies course <laughs> well thank Nancy, you very much i'm excited about that yeah N nancy in the comments is also excited so <laughs> um we are at time that went very quickly um yes, these it often did. do um but yeah we will wind down for tonight um julia and courtney thank you so much for sharing your work um it is always such a delight for us to just put these together and then sit back and listen to fantastic writers share and then the conversations that follow after are always so good to 
um, just talk about our art and what we're doing and why. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you, thank you to everyone us. who tuned in tonight with us. Um, or if you come back to this later, if you share this with somebody else, um, thank you for listening. We'll be back at three o'clock tomorrow afternoon. We have three more um, writers sharing their work as we wind down our 2021 season. So um, definitely check that out. We're excited to hear um, more pieces from them. Um, but until then, everyone have a good evening and thanks for listening. <laughs>